Yeah. Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Our guest today is one of the leading philosophers of this generation. Many of us know him as the co-creator, with the late Ken Taylor, of Philosophy Talk, a pioneering philosophy podcasting program which questions everything except your intelligence. I reckon that many people, myself included, were introduced to the fun and beauty of philosophical thinking through this program. He's also known for his book, The Art of Procrastination, which offers a more positive, more structured way of putting off things you have to do in order to do other more productive things. The, philosoph the philosophically initiated among us may know him through his contributions in various areas of philosophy. His ideas on situation semantics, developed with John Barwise, introduces an alternative formal account of explaining how meaning in information processing work. His defense of Hume's wretched substitute, a broadly compatibilist view of free will and determinism, has gained some traction as well. Arguably, his lasting legacy is his frege influenced views on self-knowledge, which demystify the notion of the self. To talk about his views on things that matter, we have the philosoph philosopher extraordinaire, John Perry, emeritus professor of philosophy in both UC Riverside and Stanford University. So hello, Professor Perry. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Thank you very much, JJ. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled that you were influenced by Philosophy Talk, and I'm thrilled that you started up something along the same lines in the Philippines. I think that's really great. No, oh, thanks for that. So be yeah. before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get started in philosophy? Well, uh, that's a good question. I guess I got started because I always had a, a philosophical bent, but I didn't know that for a long time. When I went to college, I mainly went in order to play football. <laughs> um, but I wasn't really all that good at football, so I went to a small college so I could make the team. But I wasn't even good enough to make the first team. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the season, the coach came by, he put his arm around me, he said, Perry, you're small, but you're slow. <laughs> Maybe next year, don't worry about coming out for football and just concentrate on academics. I think you'd be good in the humanities. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that was very good advice. So that's what I did. And uh, pretty soon I took my first philosophy course. And, um, you know, we, we studied Plato. Uh, and, it, well, we studied utopias, starting with Plato and then B.F. Skinner and then somebody else's name I forget, but it'll come to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a very famous guy that wrote, oh, Brave New World. Who wrote Brave New World? Huxley, Aldous Huxley. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Right. <laughs> so uh, then I continued in philosophy and I actually did pretty good and I got a, uh, a fellowship to Cornell. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at Doan College where I was, philosophy mostly, mostly consisted of Plato, Aristotle, Sartre, and Heidegger. <laughs> <laughs> a good combination. <laughs> yeah, but at Cornell, uh, philosophy mostly consisted of Wittgenstein and Thompson, mm -hmm. and with roots of both of them in Frege. So that's how I spent, uh, I wrote my dissertation on Frege's views about identity. Okay, so... I was hooked in analytical philosophy by then. So it's analytic philosophy all the way for you since Cornell University? Well, not quite. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I actually uh, always liked Sartre. Mm -hmm. uh, and then recently, I, I, be, I wouldn't say like, but I began to appreciate that Heidegger had some pretty good ideas. Heidegger? So from, <laughs> from your college years reading Heidegger, now you're back to reading Heidegger. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually back because I had a, a PhD student at Riverside, I mean, it was out on his committee, mm -hmm. who thought that Heidegger's views and my views had a connection. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, my, my views are kind of based on information and acquiring information and what Dretzky calls 
harnessing information. And Heidegger doesn't talk about those things, but he's, his, his view is you're kind of thrust into the world uh, with some primitive ability to gather information from perception and put it to use. Mm -hmm. And then you have a series of breakdowns. I mean, this is not scholarship. This is just... <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's all right. Then you have a series of breakdowns and to, to deal with them, you have, you develop more and more complicated content. I think for Heidegger, that's the notion of you're thrown in the world. <laughs> yeah, a being in the world, then there's a brokenness in the world. That's why you need to, yeah. Think, yeah, to think about. So, so I, I certainly don't agree with everything Heidegger thought. <laughs> for example, his Nazism does not appeal to me. <laughs> but I do think he had some good ideas. And so I, I don't sit around and read Heidegger on my own. But sometimes people suggest paragraphs to me that I find very interesting. Okay, so who, who else influenced you to pursue an academic career in philosophy? Well, actually, the main influence is my father-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my late father-in-law. After I listened to my, foot, my, uh, my um, football coach, and I started to focus on academics, which I'd never done in high school. And... Uh, this was a religious college, so we had to take a course in religion. Mm -hmm. And our um, teacher, Dr. Frothingham, wanted us each to write a paper on their thoughts about God. So I really got into it. I wrote a paper about God and different ideas of God and reasons for thinking that God existed and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so after he graded them, he, he read my paper to the class as a, a really good example of, of what might be done. Mm -hmm. So after class, this pretty girl comes up to me and she says, thanks, asshole. <laughs> you really were in the curve for the rest of us. Uh -huh. So uh, we started dating. <laughs> <laughs> and we got married about a year later. Mm -hmm. It turned, turned out, oddly enough, that her father was a professor of philosophy and religious studies at Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas. And we got to know each other, and he, he learned that what I was getting at Doan College was really kind of what he thought is out of date. Mm -hmm. And he started giving me books by... Uh, like Wittgenstein's Tractatus and Wittgenstein's Investigations and so forth. And um, so uh, he, he, and he also told me, which I had no idea that you could make a living being a philosopher, mm -hmm. which may not be true now, but it was true then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he was really one of the biggest influences. And he's the one who said, no, you should go to Cornell. That's the place to go. Okay. Uh, so he was, a, he was a great guy, made a big influence on me. Not so much that what he believed, I don't know what he believed really, but uh, just his, his awareness of the importance of analytical philosophy is what led me to Cornell. And, you know, that's... Then when I got to uh, UCLA in 1968, I went to UCLA as an assistant professor. And at that time, uh, UCLA was just the forefront of thinking about philosophy from the point of view of modal logic and possible worlds. So this is where David Lewis is as well? I thought David Lewis and I were assistant professors together. And okay. <laughs> Richard Montague uh, was a full professor and uh, David Kaplan was an associate professor. Mm -hmm. So I went to all their seminars and absorbed all I could. I never have really come to believe in at possible worlds is the greatest idea ever, but I, I I, so I went from being kind of a Wittgenstein in Austin to being kind of a combination ordinary language philosopher and technically aware philosopher, not really a technical philosopher. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to Stanford, of course, another, this is 1974, another very technically and philosophy, science and logic oriented place. Uh, and, and there I worked with John Barwise, who was a big influence. I, I do very well with logic as long as I have 
a collaborator can explain what the fuck is going. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> what the fuck was going on? If I left mm -hmm. it my own, I stick to English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I wrote my dissertation on Frege. He's always been a big influence. I just wrote another book on Frege called uh, Frege's Detour. Um, but I must say, over the last twenty years, uh, I mostly just sit in my chair and think. Mm -hmm. and only read what somebody else has to say when I have to. But, you know, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe delete that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what is philosophy for you and what's the best thing about it? I heard in an interview that you have an analogy between philosophers and lawyers. The best lawyers are given the hardest <laughs> cases to defend. And by the same token, the best philosophers are given the hardest, stupidest ideas, as you have said. So what's the what is oh, yeah. philosophy and why is it the best thing? What's the best thing about it? Well, I, I think the best thing about philosophy is if you're a philosopher by nature, that is, you just have this kind of mind that asks why, what does it mean, how do you know? That's your first reaction to everything. Mm. Uh, not, oh, that's right because the Pope says so, or that's right because the Pope didn't say so, uh, or that's right. But geez, what does that mean? Why should I believe that? And a lot of kids are like that, you know, 12 year olds, 10 year olds, 14 year olds. They don't get a lot of encouragement from institutions like schools. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't necessarily get discouraged, but you know, if you go to high school in America, we used to get a lot of history courses, a lot of English courses uh science and math but you don't really get philosophy uh but i think this is a, a very important part of a lot of people's personalities and so when they get to a college and take a philosophy course they say wow that that i, I really groove to that so mm -hmm. uh and the, those people you know they don't really solve many of our most practical problems but, <laughs> but you know in the long run uh, i think they're a good thing for society to have philosophers and, and so it's good to have philosophy teachers um so the most important thing about philosophy to me is it's what i like to do it's what i find myself thinking about if i sit down mm -hmm. uh the next best thing is that when i find a student or a child or a grandchild that has this frame of mind, it's really a wonderful feeling to kind of make it legitimate for them to think about, mm -hmm. are we really free? Um, do we really have minds? Does Christianity really make sense? Does Buddhism really make sense? Does anything make sense? Mm -hmm. Is there a world out there at all? Um, so I, just, I think it's, um, a little like art doesn't appeal to everyone, but it's very important for those to whom it appeals. And I'm glad to be a part of their lives because I'm one of them. And <laughs> you are too, obviously, and you have the same, same zeal to reach out to others like yourself and say, hey, this is an okay thing to be interested in. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. So listen to my program and uh, <laughs> um you know, some now lawyer. Now, the, what you mentioned, <laughs> I've known a lot of really brilliant people over my career. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Richard Montague and David Kaplan, studied people like Quine. Um, and my mind always operates at two levels. At the higher level, it says, God, these guys are brilliant. I'll never come up with anything that's true about things that they've thought about because they're so bright. Mm -hmm. But at the lower level, the one that's in there 95% of the time, I think, God, my ideas are right and their ideas are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I asked myself, well, what's going on here? And I invented a myth. The myth is that there's a muse of philosophy. Mm -hmm. I don't know her name. But she's a little bit like the person in charge of uh, defense for people that can't afford lawyers. Uh, I don't know if you have that in the Philippines, but you probably do. We have it in America. Public defenders. Yeah, we have that here. 
so my, my imagination is a public defender gets a bunch of cases. She has a bunch of lawyers working for her. And she gives the easy cases to the least brilliant lawyers. Mm -hmm. The cases anyone should be able to win. And then the really difficult cases, you know, where somebody was caught and gun his hand over a corpse. <laughs> uh, you know, she gives to the most brilliant lawyers. Well, I think the music philosophy is the same way. If she comes up with a really crazy idea that makes no sense, she gives it to someone who's so brilliant, they'll be able to defend it, like David Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But when she comes up with a really good idea that's easy to defend, because it makes a lot of sense, she gives it to me. <laughs> so that's, that's my view. Okay, that, that's, that's only funny. At the, only at the bottom level, I admit at the top level, the chances of my being right and David Lewis being wrong are very small. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, do you really believe in an infinity of possible worlds equally as real as our own? Each one, each possibility in our world having a, a world that makes that possibility actual? I don't see any reason to believe any of that. But. <laughs> okay, so would you say so, that, yeah, that you have an overall so you've been pretty good, but now you're fading a little. You disappeared. Or what I've said has struck you so much that you're frozen. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Wait. I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, now you're back. Now you're back. Uh, I hear okay. you. Okay, so would you say that you have an overall philosophy, an overall view of how to do philosophy? Well, I'm 77 years old, and the time's running out to develop one. Mm -hmm. But I'm a naturalist in the sense that I think humans are part of nature, and even our consciousness and our uh, freedom has to be explained in naturalistic terms. On the other hand, I don't equate naturalism with materialism. I think materialism is a philosophy from the 18th and 19th century that's pretty much been refuted. Uh, materialism, the idea that you go back to Locke and you have material that has, has these primary qualities, shape, so forth, shape, size, and then that's all there is. Well, no, no physicist believes that anymore. They have all kinds of non-material properties mm -hmm. most of which they don't really understand <laughs> you know like spin and being a quark and so mm -hmm. forth so my naturalism doesn't say well a physicist of the 18th century or 19th century or the early 20th century or the late 20th century even now had everything right it's just that i think that eventually or or theoretically uh we're all part of the same natural world, uh, in particular Earth, mm -hmm. which was a bit of a miracle that occurred for under very special conditions. And we need to understand ourselves, everything from the way that balls drop to the way that people think, uh, in terms of a theory that takes account of all the evidence. So that that's my view. Um, and um, there's a lot of questions that uh, I wish I had answers for. Uh, what is the meaning of life? Well, <laughs> <laughs> one of the big questions. Well, one of the big questions. And uh, I think the important thing is not to be sucked into some inadequate theory. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, not to end up with the view that life is meaningless. The question is, well, Given that it's meaningful, is it is it meaningful only to humans? Does it have meaning in terms of nature as a whole, mm -hmm. or is it is it meaningful because there's some necessarily have a completely worked out positive view? But after you've run this program for a couple of years, you will, and then you can send it to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go now to your more technical work on situation semantics. What is yes. situation semantics all about and what is its target and how does it work? 
Well, situation semantics is, um, well, let me back up. So as I see, modern analytical philosophy really begins with Frege and Russell. Mm -hmm. Both brilliant guys. And, uh, uh, but when you get to the end of the Frege Russell period, you don't have, you have a lot of solutions in that Frege gave us good notation for logic and a good understanding of what it was all about. Uh, Russell gave us even more notation and more theories about what it was about, and he identified a lot of paradoxes and he gave us a pretty good notation. Uh -huh. But when when you end up in you know the the late twenties early thirties, uh, Frege is dead. Russell is getting old and turning into other things. Uh, you you don't really have a consensus that they were right about much of anything. And the influence of Russell's paradox, uh, which was originally a problem for Frege's formalization of logic, was really important. Uh -huh. Now, as a result of that, you end up with, with the, what we think of as the Quine, what I think of as the Quine Davidson, Carnap Quine Davidson era. Carnap tried his best to make everything work within a basically Fregean framework. And uh, Tarski and others came up with the idea of a model. Mm -hmm. Model is a function from bits of language to extensions and for sentences, truth values. Can you put those together? Carnap really tried. And he came up with the notion of, of what you might call a, a realistic model. You know, the model, instead of being just a function from bits of language to extensions, is a function from bits of language to what I would call, he didn't, but what I would call properties and propositions. Mm -hmm. um, now, this notion uh, he called called a possible world, at least I think he did, but it really came into vogue with um, Kripke. Kripke. Yep. And for Kripke, an index, uh, possible world is an index for a model interpreted in that realistic way. And then he proved some very powerful theorems about modal logic in terms of possible worlds understood that way. On, on the other side, at about the same time, you had Quine. Mm -hmm said, well, Frege is great, but all the intentional stuff, the properties, the propositions, that's bullshit. <laughs> uh, we, we should take Frege's theory of sense and ignore it, but take his theory of reference. And his theory of reference, uh, uh, words in general stand for sets and sentences stand for truth values. Mm -hmm. And so that's quite an extensionalism, and he's tried to make that the basis of logic and philosophy of science. And then Davidson came along and said, uh, yeah, and, and you know, we can do quite a bit of philosophy of language within that framework. But at the same time, Quine's students, Kripke and David Lewis, were saying, well, not quite. So they decided we don't want to just be extensionalists but we don't want to ignore our teacher's <laughs> skepticism about, about properties and propositions. So we will, have, we, have, we will have an extensionalist interpretation of properties and propositions. Well, how the fuck are you gonna do that? Well, all you have to do is introduce an infinity of possible worlds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, so on my view, uh, um, that's what I call Frege's detour. Mm -hmm. I'll send you a copy of that book. So. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> and and so this, I think what we need to do is go back to Frege, not the Frege of sense and reference, but the Frege of the regression. Mm -hmm. And there we have properties, circumstances, propositions, what she calls thoughts, mm -hmm. at the level of sense, and at the level of reference, we have extensions, although he was really pre-set theory, so he has different terminology, and truth values. Mm -hmm. And he put that all together in the big riff shift, and then he was talked out about, talked out a part of it by himself, uh, and I think, well, we should go back to the big shift. Now, that's what we really did in situations and attitudes. Mm -hmm. Because in the big riff shift, Frege had circumstances. 
circumstance, I mean, it wasn't a technical term for him, but if we reconstruct it, we say, well, a circumstance or a state of affairs uh, is individually by a sequence of a, of, a, of a relation and a suitable number of, a suitable sequence of objects uh -huh. and a time and a location. So Barweiss and I had the idea that, well, really, that should be the starting point, or the real starting point should be what we call situations. What's the situation? Well, the situation is a region of space-time where things happen. Uh -huh. uh, Barweiss wouldn't like that because he didn't think I paid enough attention to mathematics. <laughs> Since he's died, I've quit worrying about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we got situations, regions of space-time, and stuff happens. Okay, so is this like a uh, state of affairs, uh, like yes. Dave Armstrong? Yes, we called them states of affairs. Uh, well, the situation, as I see it now, we were a little confused in it. As I see it now, the situation is a spatio-temporal region with stuff happening. Mm -hmm. And then we, as humans, we don't interact with that in terms of basic objects and properties, if there are any. We interpret that in terms of what we called uniformities between happenings mm -hmm. and properties and objects that we familiarly talk about that are part of our conceptual apparatus arise out of that. By the way, this is very, uh, my take on this is very much influenced by Whitehead, mm -hmm. who was one of my heroes in uh, college. So uh, Whitehead said the world consists of actual occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so situations are bounded. So instead of a possible world, and it's interesting, people call them possible worlds, but why worlds? They're mm. universes. They <laughs> they're universes. Mm -hmm. Why do people want to call them worlds? Well, because the universe is so big, it makes you dizzy, <laughs> right? You know, oh, I used to take all the possible worlds and look for most similar. Well, does that really make sense if you've got universes? <laughs> 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 And by the way, is there any reason to believe that the the universe has any bounds? Mm -hmm. I've never seen any reason, but that seems anyway. So I digress. So our idea was we need to reinstate what I now call circumstances, but we called states of affairs, which had been exiled by Frege's decision that that sentences stand for truth values, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, uh, and, and doing that will be the key to understanding the propositional attitudes, which is to say sentences like, uh, JJ believes that the Philippines will rule the world in 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's probably false. <laughs> uh, 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 I believe that Trump is an idiot, which mm -hmm. is both true and a belief in something true. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and Frege had a very persuasive but rather complicated theory of propositional attitudes and we gave uh, a much simpler theory of propositional attitudes in terms of situations and uh, states of affairs. Okay. And uh, I wouldn't say that we won the day. Most of the philosophical world said, hmm, interesting, but uh, I don't think I have it quite right. Mm -hmm. But I've kind of been working on it ever since, making it better, I think. And uh, so I don't know what your original question was, but <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. Oh, yeah. yeah, influence. So, yeah. And then I worked with David Israel. David was a philosopher turned computer science scientist. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of fun uh, thinking about information and action and so forth. And those are the views I've more or less tried to develop over the last 40 years. Um, Although, um, with, you know, some success in converting others, but, uh, you know, what okay. are you going to do? Muse of philosophy gives you an easy task. You have to fulfill it, whether anybody believes it or not. <laughs> okay, let's go back to situation semantics. So, the, the idea is that you have the circumstances, and we mm -hmm. are confronted by those cir circumstances, and we have attitude towards them. Mm -hmm. But are these circumstances some actual states of affairs, or even possible states of affairs? Well, I believe a circumstance, what I call a circumstance, and a state of affairs uh, are both, I mean, I'm talking about not necessarily everything Barwise would agree with, but he would agree with most of it. Mm -hmm. so, what would be, uh, so I think of reality as what I call concrete reality. That's happenings. Mm 
Okay. Happenings in space-time locations or regions. So these are actual things. And these are actual. These are real. Mm -hmm. But what humans interact with is not the real world as such, but the world of possibilities. Mm. Yeah, it'll be a while I'm being interviewed. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Um, so, so circumstances or states of affairs are really possibilities. Mm. Uh, and, and so forget about language, forget about negation. Just say, oh, so we got, we got these possibilities. Possibilities are, are circumstances. They're individuated by a relation and a sequence of individuals and a time and a location. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just think of them that way, don't think of them as sentences. Just think of them as things that theoretically we can describe in that way. Okay. Now, they come in pairs that are opposites. Mm -hmm. uh, JJ has had dinner already. JJ hasn't had dinner already. Those are opposite circumstances. Only one is a fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm so, seeing I'm seeing the Frege influence here, right? Yeah. So Frege has a yeah. notion of the true and the false, and you have, right. yeah, okay. But on my view, I don't think we're too clear about it. You have to distinguish between circumstances and facts, and propositions and truth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think propositions are made to classify representations, mm -hmm. which is say beliefs and utterances. Whereas states of affairs or circumstances are abstract objects for just classifying the world. Mm -hmm. And the relation between them is that propositions are the Boolean closure of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever I say a sentence like that, you shouldn't take it too seriously because I need to have Barwise or Israel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, you don't understand what Bull had in mind. And so <laughs> I'm giving you my current thinking. Okay. So so I think a lot of philosophy I mean, so I, I think you need states of affairs to get at possibilities for the world. And mm -hmm. you need propositions to get at uh representation of what people are thinking or saying. And so we have, we have circumstances and facts and non-facts, and we have propositions and truths and falsehoods. Now, I'm really giving you the, either the cutting edge or the blunt edge of my thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. But how did you get in, yeah. So how did you get no, into this kind of work? In the situations and attitudes? Yep. Well, uh, I, I once I got to Stanford, I was at UCLA from 1968 to 1974, and I went to Stanford in 1974. Uh, and I came with tenure because uh, those were different times. And two years later, I was chairman. Mm -hmm. And after being chairman for a year or two, I hired Barwise because Dove Gabay left and we needed a logician. And uh, then once Barwise and I got here, I didn't get to know him very well until it turned out that one quarter we were both giving seminars. And in my seminar, I was worried about self-knowledge and I and things like that. And, and I was really saying we need something like states of affairs to, to, to be the uh, objects of beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, and something like uh, uh, Kaplan, you know, called De Re, or somebody called De Re Propositions and so forth and so on. Mm. Uh, but, 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 um, uh, and, and, but, but Frege had argued that circumstances or states of affairs cannot be what sentences refer to. Mm. Barwise was, talking about what he called um, naked infinity perception statements. Mm. That's like I would say, JJ sees the Pacific from his office. And not 
not that JJ sees that the Pacific Ocean is there. Not a not a that clause, mm. but just what's called a naked infinitive. Uh, or say so. So we got a number of verbs that that don't take that clauses. A number of cognitive, informational, action verbs that don't take uh, that clauses typically. So, so they're not propositional. They don't seem propositional. So and so so Barwise was particularly interested in uh, in in perception verbs. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. JJ sees the spider crawling up his leg. Mm. It doesn't follow from that that JJ sees sees that there is a spider crawling up his leg. Mm -hmm. uh, this is all related to Dretsky's work uh, on on information. Mm -hmm. So that's. And, and Barway said, to get at how naked infinity perception reports work, you, you have to have, you can't bring in sense because it's not sees that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't get by with the truth value. You really need to have a state of affairs. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for some information verbs, like shows. Um, uh, the trail of blood on the ground shows that the corpse was pulled out of the office. Sorry, not a very happy <laughs> uh, Now, you know, uh, there is a shows that, but there also is a shows that, that seems to not be happy with a that clause. Mm. So he was convinced mostly for the perception case, but also for the information case that you, you can't just have truth values as a reference. Mm -hmm. And both of us in our seminars were, were dealing with an argument that Freya came up with, or possibly church. Uh, Freya suggests it, church articulates it, call, that we call the slingshot. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it the slingshot because Davidson uses it against Reichenbach. Mm -hmm. So this and, is a slingshot argument, right? Yeah, so this is a case of a very small person, Davidson, using a very small weapon, the slingshot, to try <laughs> to play a giant. Uh. <laughs> but we didn't say that's why we were calling it that. Okay. <laughs> we, we thought Reichenbach was a giant. Mm. Uh, and Reichenbach believed in states of affairs. Um, and so did Carnap in one version of his book, which Church criticized. Anyway, so there's the slingshot. And we found over lunch one day that we were both considering the slingshot in our seminars, which is kind of a coincidence. Because, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that got us started. We decided to write a paper together on the slingshot. And then we ended up writing a book together about situations and attitudes. And, uh, you know, Okay, so did this inform much of your philosophical views or is it the other way around? So you started with the self, the notion of self-knowledge, then you're thinking uh, about... So no, I was, I, was, uh, I was drawn into this part of the... Flight. I was very interested in Frege as a graduate student, but mostly about identity, not so much propositional attitudes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. but, but then I got involved in the self... Uh, Partly, when I got to UCLA, the chairman there was uh, Don Kalish, mm -hmm. uh, who, who, like uh, Richard Montague, was a student of Tarski's from Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, wait, am I? No, I'm, I'm miss. I'm miss so I taught at UCLA. Then I went to Stanford, and Pat Soupies was there, mm -hmm. a very old and incredibly distinguished person. Soupies, is that the pronunciation? I always yeah, thought it Patrick, was. Yeah, Patrick Soupies, or oh. not everybody does that. That's the way he pronounced it. Okay. Uh, so he called me into his office. I'm scared to death. He's the most, you know, one of the biggest important philosophers I ever met. And he says, okay, Perry, we've hired you. What is it you do? Mm -hmm. I say, oh, well, I, I think uh, I do philosophy of language. Mm -hmm. He says, you don't do philosophy of language. I said, well, I mean, I'm not a logician because like Richard Montague is a logician, but I'm really interested in language. So I think of myself as a philosopher of language. He says, no, 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 no. Church is a logician. <laughs> Arsky is a logician. Mm -hmm. 
Montague is a philosopher of language. <laughs> a philosopher of language. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you don't know enough logic to be a Kaplan or Montague, so you're not a philosopher of language. Mm -hmm. Mm, I said, hmm, well, could I be a phenomenologist? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, no, no, you can't be a phenomenologist. We got a phenomenologist, Dag van Follestal, mm -hmm. and he's editor of the Journal of Symbolic Logic. <laughs> Same, very logic oriented place. Uh, and I said, well, what am I going to be? And he said, well, why don't you say that you specialize in the self? <laughs> so I became a philosopher of the self. Yeah. Anyway, so, but then at the same time, I was very influenced by Kaplan, who'd gotten into demonstrations and indexicals. Mm -hmm. So I kind of put those interests together and came up with uh, some views about the self and the word I that got a lot of attention uh, and kind of defined who I was going to be for a while. And that was what led me to do this seminar. Mm -hmm trying to kind of combine Kaplan's theory and Castaneda's insights and Frege and Shoemaker. And I was finding I just couldn't do that without states of affairs. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a combination of both things. Okay, let's go to your views about the self, personal identity and identity. So your work seems to be a shout out of Gottlob Frege's view. So what's your view about identity? Well, uh, when I was writing my dissertation, um, uh, Peter Geech, a man I admire very much, mm -hmm. uh, had put forward a view called relative identity. And in spite of being a big Frege admirer, his theory of relative identity was, was a criticism of Frege. Mm -hmm. He said Frege thought there was this relation, identity, uh, transitive and uh, whatever, you know, uh, reflexive and whatever. And um, that, you know, any, any, anything in itself is related, anything is related to itself by the relation of identity. The same for all things, whether it's the number four is identical with the number four, mm -hmm. uh, or, um, you know, uh, uh, Cicero is identical with Tully or whatever it is. And Geach very insightfully says there's something wrong here because, you know, when numbers, the relation between the number four and the number two plus two doesn't have anything to do with space and time or anything like that. Uh -huh. The relation between, uh, 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 the relation of personal identity has a lot to do with, with minds and space and time and so forth. He says, so we really need to recognize lots of different identity relations, relative identity. Uh, and in my dissertation, I said, no, Geach doesn't have it quite right. The different relations are what I call the unity relations. Mm -hmm. These are relations between the parts or phases of a single thing. And that's what differs from kind of object to kind of object. Right, if you're talking about personal identity, you're, you're talking about the identity between different stages of what we call a single person. Okay, so this is this is a distinction between synchronous and diachronic, or yeah. synchronic well, and diachronic? That's, I think that's Carnap's phrase. So, 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 you know, uh, take your office. Uh, now, you know, you got two walls of your office. They're different walls. Mm -hmm but they have a certain relation between them that make them walls of the same office. Uh, take two parts of a factory, maybe separate buildings, uh -huh. but still they're different buildings, but they're parts of the same factory set. So I said, you have to distinguish the identity, which is a relation, just like Frege said, uh, a relation that everything, anything has to itself uh, that confers indiscernibility and substitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, the relation between the temporal or spatial parts of that thing, if it's a concrete object, uh, such that makes them parts uh, or stages of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I said that what Geach takes as cases of relative identity are really cases of uh, uh, referring to different things, not 
using different relations of identity. Mm. Now, I should be able to think of a good example right now, but let's see, can I think of a good example? Well, you say something, you say, you look at something, on, you look at a couple of letters when I'm looking at your thing. Mm. Jeremiah Joven Joaquin. So we got three J's or do we, we have one letter that occurs three times or do we have three letters that are importantly related? Mm. Well, Geese said, well, that's relative identity. You got the same J type, but different J tokens. And I said, well, yeah, but also when you say this J, th this letter is the same as that letter, pointing to two different occurrences of J, or you say this letter isn't the same letter as that letter, the problem isn't different kinds of identity, the problem is what you're referring to. Right, right. Anyway, so that, that, <laughs> That was a paper that at the time uh, received a lot of attention and got me two jobs. First, a job at UCLA, <laughs> and then a job with tenure at Stanford a couple of years later. Those were, that was a different period. Okay, so how did it influence your views about personal identity? Well, then I began to think that, uh, so personal identity, I want to interpret personal identity in these terms. This wasn't part of the dissertation, but later. Uh, so. So how can I make sense of the insights of Locke and Shoemaker about personal identity, the insights of Kaplan about the way the word I works, uh -huh. uh, and uh, you know, uh, Parfit's, well actually Parfit and I wrote about the same time, but uh, cases of splitting cells, which Shoemaker had talked about and Parfit was talking about. Uh -huh. uh, well, I think I can do it in this framework if we distinguish between person stages and persons. And what we're doing when we try to analyze personal identity is analyze the relation between person stages or experiences or mental state phases, whatever language you like, that makes them stages or mental state phases of a single person. Right. And so that's then, then I got thinking about persons and the self and where the word I fits in and uh, came up with this theory of people call essential index caliable. Well, that's not what I call it. But. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. let's, let's go there to your, your theory of essential indexicality, which you don't call that. Uh, it's concerned about self-knowledge, right? And you have an example about Ernst Mach. Can we go there? Can you expound on oh. that example? Okay, all right. So, so essential indexicality is, isn't saying that indexicals are essential right. to talk about the thing about itself. So mm -hmm. I, I just wrote a short book on that called something. Reflexivity. Huh? Reflexivity, I think that's your... Yeah, no, I wrote a book called uh, uh, Rethinking the Essential Indexicals, mostly a critique of uh, Kaplan and Deaver. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, so but that... The, the, the phrase essential indexical became very popular while the theory that I actually intended to be exposed was mostly ignored, but anyway. <laughs> so, so, but uh, so I, came, I came to think, uh, and this, this was connected with some of the thoughts in uh, situations and attitudes, uh, that um, self-knowledge is a very interesting phenomenon that is normally or paradigmatically expressed with the word I. Mm. But on Kaplan's theory, uh, if I say John Perry lives in Palo Alto and I say I live in Palo Alto, we're expressing the same proposition, mm. the day rate proposition that John Perry lives in Palo Alto. Um, now th this, view of his has two sides to it. On the one side, it's extending to indexicals the view that Donellan and Kripke and others had come to regarding reference. Mm -hmm. The reference doesn't work the way Frege thought it did with his theory of sense and reference. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it's got a different account, usually a historical account. And the propositions we express in propositional attitude statements, when we say, uh, JJ believes John Perry lives in Palo Alto, uh, and JJ believes you, talking to me, I believe, JJ says, I believe you live in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. express the same de re or singular proposition. Right, right. Okay, so Kaplan was extending that to indexicals. On the other hand, he did not think the theory of reference for indexicals was at all simple the way the kind of historical chain theory for names is. He mm -hmm. thought indexicals had, uh, unlike proper names, a kind of a robust meaning. Mm -hmm. So you look up in a dictionary, and that's the character. And uh, so, so uh, the probably essential indexical was, as I conceive it, was that if I say, uh, uh, I live in Palo Alto, you say, uh, how come you're so worried about the fires? I live in Palo Alto and the whole <laughs> California's on fire. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't explain the same thing if it's like, well, John Perry lives in, Califor in Palo Alto and California's on fire. Mm -hmm. uh, the I seems to play an essential role in explanation. And names don't. Right. Yeah, you have to argue a bit, you have to bring in some Grice, but pretty much by that time, Kripke and Donnellan and Kaplan had all convinced themselves and most of the rest of us that no, singular names give us singular propositions. They don't really have senses. They're rigid designators, basically. They're rigid designators, right. uh, yeah. Uh, but I said that doesn't work for I because because the difference between I live in Palo Alto and he lives in Palo Alto, pointing to a picture of myself, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it does play an important role. It's it's exp it's explanatory. They're essential to the explanation. So that was where the phrase came from. It wasn't they're essential to thinking, mm -hmm. but they're essential to the explanation. So um, so that's the kind of view I've been working on for a long time and. It's in that book that you've got there, personal identity, personal identity in the self. Mm -hmm. And an important notion is, is the theory of, uh, of self-knowledge, that some states are normally self-informative. Right. Some ways of per per perceiving are normally self-informative. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't know, the best examples are not always, are not always the most uh, polite ones. <laughs> but uh, but we'll we'll set urination aside, which is a wonderful example. But if if Jeremiah if JJ has a headache, then he will know that he has a headache, mm -hmm. and he will know it in a certain way. And it seems like it's the same way that I know if I have a headache. Mm -hmm. So that seems like at at a high enough level of abstraction, similar to Kaplan's notion of a character. Right. Right. Uh, I is a self-referential way of referring. The feeling of I have a headache is a self-informative way of knowing. Mm -hmm. And we also have self-affecting ways of acting. So if on my head itches, I do this. If your head itches, you do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't bring about the same proposition. Mm -hmm. I bring it about that John Perry's head gets scratched. You bring it about that JJ's head gets scratched. So there's self-informative ways of knowing and self-informative, self-affecting ways of action. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me, well, this is really the basis of all evolution, right? Because, you know, throughout most of the animal kingdom or even go, that's what you need. You need self-informative knowledge that initiates automatically self-affecting action. If you're a chicken and you see a kernel of corn in front of you, you'll walk to the kernel of corn and peck. Mm -hmm. You will have acquired through perception knowledge about yourself and that will have caused knowledge that nour or action that nourishes yourself. Mm -hmm. Now this formula is the same for all chickens. Uh, what a chicken does when that chicken sees a kernel of corn is the same as what every other chicken does. Simplify a little, no doubt. But what it believes is different than any other chicken will believe in virtue of the same perception. But maybe we shouldn't talk about belief in the case of chickens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but we as theorists, not as chickens, but as theorists trying to figure out how chickens work, we need to talk about something like belief. We say, well, the chicken picks up information 
about the very chicken that's doing the perceiving. Mm -hmm. About itself. And it, yeah, and then it takes actions that will be good for the very chicken that's doing the perceiving. Mm -hmm. And we need to refer to the chicken to do that. We the theorists. But the chicken doesn't need to refer to the chicken. Of course. <laughs> Chickens work exactly the same. They don't. Uh, this is why the essential index of is so misleading if people interpret it that way. It doesn't need a name for itself and it doesn't even indexical for itself. Mm -hmm. So I say the chicken has knowledge concerning itself. We, the theorists, need to give a propositional content to what it knows, or if you don't like knows, what it has some positive access towards. Mm -hmm. And we have to explain the difference between this chicken and that chicken when they're in the same perceptual state, but the chicken doesn't have to do that. So that, that was one big connection between all the philosophy of language stuff and all the self stuff, which still seems to me to be right very deep. And I think, uh, I think it's up to some philosopher from the Philippines though to really <laughs> work it out in detail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So uh, I'm thinking about your theory of self-knowledge and how it demystifies the notion of we have a direct access of ourselves. Yeah, I like that phrase, demystifies. Yeah, I think you use that phrase, actually. I'm just quoting you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. so, so how did this, your theory of self-knowledge demystify that notion of self? Uh, well, uh, the self is, you know, self-knowledge I mean, the self is a, is a historical philosophical problem going back to, you know, Christians and pre-Christians like Plato and so forth. And um, it, it just, it, it's, you know, it's a puzzling phenomenon. Uh -huh. Elves are very important to human beings. And they had all kinds of demands on the self. Like by the time we get to Christianity, it's how self has to get you from here to heaven or hell and Descartes wants it to be immaterial and so forth and so on. But uh, if we kind of ignore those things or, you know, uh, leave them to the, to the teacher in, in, in a Catholic school that is telling you about the Bible, but then ignore them when you go to the philosophy class, which I'm sure what happens at your university. <laughs> <laughs> there are some, still some very puzzling things, but, uh, uh, one of the central puzzles is the, the puzzle of how the same states in different systems carry different information mm -hmm. and yet work in the same way, right? Um, uh, this is connected with this problem that, uh, of so-called internalism and externalism. Right, right. Uh, it's very plausible that, that uh, my brain is in a certain state and that's internal, right? It's, it's, not, it's not relational. Right? On the other hand, uh, my brain being in a certain state will cause me to perform certain actions. Mm -hmm. And those actions will be on external objects. And the success of my action will depend on what happens to those external objects, right? Um, so some people like the so-called neo fragans think that, well, you know, somehow your internal states somehow are individuated by external objects or something. I never actually follow through on what they all believe. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, some people like Searle have a little bit, but I, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's an, it's an example of a very common philosophy in nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of Mother Nature. God gives her this assignment, you know, create a thousand species in an efficient way. And Mother Nature goes back, so how am I going to do that? I mean, you know, uh, here's, here's JJ, and he has to believe I'm in Manila. He has to believe that he is in Manila. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is Perry, and he has to believe that he's in Palo Alto. Uh, and yet Perry has to also believe that JJ is in Manila, and JJ has to believe that Perry is in Palo Alto. Now, it, it looks like uh, I'm going to have to create a lot of states. Uh -huh. I'm going to have to create the state by which JJ believes that he's in Manila, 
and the state by which JJ believes that Perry is in Palo Alto and the state by which Perry believes that JJ is in, uh -huh. you know, and then, but then those different states are going to have to connect in the right way to actions. Uh -huh. Right, you know, we don't want JJ believes that Perry's in Palo Alto. We don't want JJ putting Palo Alto on the return address of his letters. <laughs> that and, would and be God, wrong. God, being brilliant, says, "Well, go read David Kaplan." <laughs> <laughs> okay, and everything works out fine. Okay, so, uh, speaking of external, this by the way, that's what we call efficiency in situations and attitudes. Oh, okay. Uh, going back to internalism and externalism, there's a related debate concerning free will and determinism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just getting in my letter. Yeah, I was pleased, <laughs> pleased that you heard of that. Did you read the article or? Yeah, I, I actually read the article. So I think you're leaning towards a union compatibilist view in your. Uh, human, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on the book now with the same title, Wretched Subterfuge. Okay. And it's both mostly aimed at the consequence argument, you know, von Inwagen and those guys. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so, so the main argument, the main thing is the consequence argument, and the main idea comes from Hume. Mm -hmm. No, you should say whom. And I, <laughs> Hume, that's all right. Uh, so, so Hume says uh, this. Uh, well, basically, Hume says, okay. So, so we got two things: can the word can and the word free. Okay, um, and Hume says, if you if you have a choice, you can do A or you can refrain from doing A. Mm. And what? What causes you to do one thing than the other is your own will, then you're free. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about that, uh, uh, that, that means the question of whether you're free in a way abstracts from your will, from the content of your will. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let me give you an example that, that, that's kind of crude, but it makes the point. All right. Uh, Suppose I'm walking down a path between Palo Alto and the Baylands, which is San Francisco Bay. Mm. And I come to a fork in the path. And there's a sign that says, to Palo Alto. Another sign that says, to Mountain View. OK, so let's apply Hume's theory. I mean, it's two sentences, so it's not really theory. <laughs> Can I go to Mountain View? Can I walk to Mountain View? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, if I can walk, and if the path goes to Mountain View, then I can walk to Mountain View. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. over. So uh, you have the ability to go there. <laughs> the ability to go there. You have yeah, the ability to go there. And and similarly, if I want, forget about wanting. If I can, I can also walk to Powell. Palo Alto, mm. because the path leads to Palo Alto, and I can walk. Mm, right. So we need a few little extra things. But so can doesn't have anything to do with what you want. Mm, right. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you want. All of, you know, we have a group of people. They come to the fork in the road. Half of them want to go to Palo. Uh, half of them want to go to Palo Alto. Half of them want to go to Mount View. But they all can go either place right so their will their desires all that shit uh will cause them to do one or the other mm -hmm. uh but have nothing to do with whether they can do one or the other that's just determined by their basic competences to walk and and the external world mm -hmm. so now if you think about the consequence argument. Are you familiar with the consequence argument? Yes. Yes. The, the basic idea is there, well, you have the beginning of the world and then you have this um, causal chain, although interestingly enough, von Inwagen and the other 
Consciousness therapy don't, don't talk about cause. They talk about entailment, but that's the mm. other side of the problem. Uh, so, and these causal chains will lead to half of the people being in a state mm -hmm. where if they think it over and deliberate, the determination of their will be to walk the mountain view. Mm -hmm. right. And the other half will, same with Palo Alto. But they all can do exactly the same thing. That's Hume's insight. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact, since, since their will, their desires and so forth, that's going to end up deciding what they do, it doesn't have anything to do with what they can do, then the history of all that has nothing to do with what they can do. The history of the universe and the laws of nature. Yeah, the, the history of the universe is, you know, it's very weird. That <laughs> true if it is, and it's very mm -hmm. weird that whether I'm going to go to Palo Alto or Mountain View depends on the, something about the Big Bang or God's mood at the time of creation. That's very weird. Don't deny that it's weird. But um, still, uh, <clears throat> uh, the fact that I can go to Mountain View and mm -hmm. I can go to Palo Alto, that's a property I share with all the other people in the group. All right. As different as their histories are, the history will depend will determine what they do, mm -hmm. but it won't determine what they can do. Mm -hmm. Now that's what I call Hume's wretched subterfuge because that's what Kant called Hume's. <laughs> right, and right. It seems to me to be true, and mm -hmm. if you follow it through, you'll see ah the consequence argument always depends on this transition between I can't change the past and I can't change the laws of nature. Therefore, uh, I can't do anything other than I was determined to do. Right. And that's just not right. <laughs> the laws of nature and the past have nothing to do. Well, uh, I mean. You have something to do with what you can. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot determine what I can and can't do. Right. So to, to, to walk the Palo Alto, I can walk the Palo Alto, I can walk the Mountain View, I will walk the Palo Alto because that's where I want to go because I have an appointment there, and mm -hmm. I like to make the appointments, blah, 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 blah. So determinism guarantees that I will walk the Palo Alto. But you're still free. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I can't walk the Mountain View. Right, right. So this is the, the so-called classical compatibilist, right? So you're preserving the idea that you're free so long as you could have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. but well, uh, except that's a conditional analysis. Right, right. And it's what Hume suggests, and that's what Moore tried to make work, and that's what Austin criticized. Mm. My analysis is not conditional. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's completely categorical. Mm. It has to do with the fact that, let's, let's put you there instead of me, so here you are. Uh, you can walk to the Palo Alto. You can walk to Mountain View. Why? Objective fact. There's a path. Right. <laughs> Second objective fact. You have legs. Mm -hmm. You can walk. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, I try to avoid the word uh, can, but I say you have the unimpaired competence to walk. Okay, better. You've got two legs. <laughs> At muscles, you're not in chains, mm. and so forth and so on. So those are all categorical facts. They're not conditional facts. Mm. So my analysis is very much like the traditional compatibilist analysis, except it doesn't have this Achilles heel of depending on conditional. Condition. All right. Yeah. Uh, and that's good because conditionals will. <laughs> You're Everybody's talking about conditionals but me, and I haven't worked out my view. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I just want to press something on this one as well, because your beliefs and desires might be determined as well by the history of the universe. Yes, and, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, but to me, on my view, that I'm working on the book, that leads to a different problem mm -hmm. that is now confused with the problem of free will and determinism. I mean, with the problem of freedom and determinism, which is the problem of free will. Mm, okay. Right. So suppose I convince you uh, the, of Hume's, re Hume's wretched subterfuge, and I convince you that therefore the consequence argument doesn't work. 
but it would be a very natural thing to say, okay, okay, so let's call it human freedom. I've got human freedom to walk either way mm -hmm. because I, I can walk either way and which I do will be determined by what I want to do. But isn't that a pretty superficial kind of freedom because how about what I want to do? That itself is, whether or not it's a requirement for can, it is something that is determined by the past and the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. So don't we want more out of freedom than human freedom? Mm. Right. Now, my view is the answer is yes, we do. But this is an importantly different problem because this problem inherits all kinds of stuff from Plato and Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas and, you know, historic debates about whether uh, uh, we're free just like Adam was before the fall. Mm -hmm. We're not free like Adam was before the fall. And we got, you know, uh, we got, uh, what's his name? Uh, St. Augustine arguing with uh, Pelagius. And mm -hmm. We got Luther arguing with Erasmus. And guess who doesn't want to write a book about all this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I taught it for years. That's enough. You know? mm -hmm. But the point is, it's a, it's a problem, ultimately, if, if you don't think it's a problem, if you're not worried about Christianity and making everything work, it's basically still a problem. It's a problem about we just don't feel like we're part of the natural world. Mm -hmm. We don't feel that our decisions are determined by the laws of nature in the same way that uh, if a tree is cut down, it will fall, or if a wind blows the leaves we don't feel like that's us. We feel like there's something much more important going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the self, which while we're at it, might as well be the soul, and then we can get to heaven. <laughs> now that's a very complicated argument. Uh, uh, but I don't, I don't deny the intuitions. The intuitions are something like agent causation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I say, well, I believe in agent causation, but I don't believe what Chisholm said about agent causation. Mm -hmm. I believe what uh, Janan Ismail says about agent causation. Well, she doesn't use the term, but she has a book. I don't, do you know her? Yeah. So it's, a, it's a great book called How Physics Makes Us Free. Mm -hmm. and, and it just points out that many of the intuitions that lead to the problem of free will are based on very natural things about to think about the difference between cells and minds like we have mm -hmm. and what the rest of the natural world has. But it turns out that they can be given a naturalistic explanation for 90% of it. I mean, if somebody thinks, well, to have free will, you have to be the ultimate source yeah, of your basic values and characters. Well, sorry, that's hopeless. Yeah, I, th I think that's a Galen Strawson argument. Yeah, although Galen, yeah, yeah, Galen is, he doesn't think we have that kind of free will. Yes, that's why we don't have free will. <laughs> if, that, if that's what free will requires, then we don't have it. But I think that the intuitions and the evidence we have for free will, which mm. I think is quite real, I mean, in a moment of moral decision, we, we don't feel determined. We feel, you know, but, but I think Janan Ismail gives us a way of looking at agent causation is a very special mm -hmm. kind of causation that is not incompatible with event causation, but it's a very, very special case of it that we can now understand in terms of contemporary physics. Anyway, that's how I hope to end my book, but I haven't figured it out yet, so. I wonder how Harry Frankfurt's higher order. Yeah, uh, so. At what I actually say is my theory of free was a combination of Frankfurt and Ismail. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm actually I'm actually writing something on Ismail. Oh, are you? Oh, good. Yeah. Good. The, the her paradox of predictability. I think that's uh, the. Uh, okay. Is that is that in her book on? Uh, I think so. It's in part of her book, but oh, there's yeah, also. On the, yeah. Can you have this program that makes you choose whatever you're not determined to do? Mm. Yeah, is that? I'm glad you're writing about that because I read that chapter and I thought, oh, oh, this is, this is, this is over my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Now uh, let's go to your more popular views. 
So philosophy <laughs> talk has been one of my inspirations in getting into philosophy. I have to tell you this. So when I was younger, in the undergraduate, I was listening to your show via online philosophy podcast, and I was hooked. But how no, did that, it... that is so terrific? It makes me so happy. Thank yeah. You. But how did you start with this program, and what was your motivation in doing it? Well, the true story goes like this. Back before the turn of the century, I started listening to a show called Car Talk on public radio. Have you ever listened to Car Talk? Nope, we don't have that here. <laughs> <laughs> now, Car Talk was these two guys back in Boston, and people would call in with problems about their car. Mm -hmm and say, well, you know, my differential doesn't work. And I went to my mechanic and I, he said I should have it all replaced. But my neighbor says, no, go to a different mechanic because you don't need to have it all replaced, blah, 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 blah. And then these two guys who were brothers were very funny and they would talk to the person about their car. Mm -hmm. And they would give them good advice, but they did it in such a way, they had such great personalities that it was hilarious. So I was listening to that and I said, well, well, you know, I'm not as funny as those guys. <laughs> you are, well. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but philosophy is so much more interesting than cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up fixing cars. I, you know, I, I grew up owning a Model A. Do you know what a Model A is? 1929 Ford. Mm -hmm. I know a lot about cars. I find cars very interesting, but not nearly as interesting as philosophy. <laughs> and um, so if there could be a show, Car Talk, that managed to get people to listen to cars for an hour, because it was funny, mm -hmm. We should be able to get a show that talked about philosophy for an hour, and it wouldn't have to be quite as funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there's all these people out there. You know, there's not much on public radio about philosophy. I mean, you know, there's shows on history and art and all kinds of stuff. So I thought that was a great idea. So I went to my friend David Israel, because David and I are very funny together. And I thought we could be as funny as Tom and Ray or whatever their name was. Mm. Or funny enough to, that, that the difference between philosophy and cars could compensate. And David says, as he often says to my ideas, that's really stupid. <laughs> I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Mm -hmm. So then I went to my friend Michael Bratman, and uh, uh, he said about the same thing. Yeah, this one is the political philosopher, right? Michael yeah, Bratman. philosopher of action. Very nice guy, old friends. So then. Uh, I hired Ken Taylor because uh, uh, in one of my census chairman. Uh -huh. Ken and I got to know each other, and so I brought the idea up to Ken, expecting one more turndown. Uh -huh. And Ken said, "Oh, that's terrific! Let's do it." Uh -huh. <laughs> but Ken, unlike me, is not a procrastinator. <laughs> so like, ten, day, ten days later, he had a hundred thousand dollars from the provost to develop the idea. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And a week and a half later, we were in Portland going to the National Public Radio Conference. And Ken induced a, a radio producer, uh, Ben Manila, to work with us. So we were really starting. And I thought to myself, hey, this was my idea. Do I feel bad that Ken's taking it over? No, not at <laughs> least. Because <laughs> he is going to take this and run with it. And it's going to be terrific. And I just need to show up every Sunday morning. And uh, that's the way it was. So, so uh, it was, you know, he, he really made the show, but I still want to get a little credit. It was originally my idea. And I think I added something. Mm -hmm. And his dying was just such a tragedy. All right. All right. I'm sorry about that but, as well. Well, I, I should say, then I took it to someone who actually was an old acquaintance of mine, a friend of a friend, who was uh, the, uh, the program director at the most important radio, public radio station in San Francisco, KQED. Mm. And uh, interestingly she enough, she had been married to a philosopher, mm. <laughs> you know, years earlier. And I gave her the idea and she was not enthused. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she just couldn't believe that philosophy could be that interesting. 
But then we took it to the second radio station, KALW, and they said, okay, let's go with it. And at the same time, Oregon Public Broadcasting, who Ben Manila knew the people, they also said, we think it's a good idea. So we started out on those two stations. And, you know, now we've got, you know, well over 100, maybe 200 stations. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm sure the people over at KQED just wake up every morning and say, oh, we could have had philosophy time. <laughs> And you're on the internet. That's why, you know. Yeah, we're, we're you on the internet. And, mm -hmm. and I'm only on now on reruns and occasionally we've got now two other guest hosts or two other hosts and they're doing really well. Mm -hmm. A guy named Josh Landy and, and uh, a fellow named uh, uh, Rachel Briggs. No, Ray Briggs. No, oh, Ray Briggs, yeah. I'm, yeah. We're friends. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, formerly Rachel Briggs, but now Ray Briggs. Unless right. I have a R A R A Briggs, R A Briggs, really nice person, right? And very bright, and uh, I think the show's in very good shape. Yeah. How do you know? How do you know Ray? So I was at the A N U Australian National University with yeah. her. Okay. So speaking of procrastination, your work on procrastination has been featured in many popular media outlets as well. Yeah. And you said that you are a procrastinator, but what's your positive twist on this otherwise negative notion? Well, I don't encourage people to procrastinate if it's not their natural. <laughs> but for people may, for who it is a natural inclination, I think some way in my life, I discovered a way of looking at it that makes you feel less guilty and more productive. Mm -hmm. And that is to say that we always have a lot of things to do and we can always rank them in terms of importance. And if you're a procrastinator, you may not have to just do none of them. Mm -hmm. You'll be at peace with yourself. It may be okay to just not do the most important ones. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're working on less important ones that are still of some value. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic idea, be a structured procrastination. And the, this doesn't mean that you should never do the important things, but, but you, you need to think it through. For one thing, a lot of things that seem most urgent really aren't because mm. some dean told you to do them, and by the time they're due, the dean will have forgotten all about them. <laughs> uh, uh, some things you can throw together in the last minute. Like a book review? or uh, Like a book <laughs> review or something. <laughs> and, you know, and there's also this myth that all of us procrastinators believe that while we're procrastinating in the back of our mind, we're thinking over the task that we're procrastinating about. And so in the end, we do a better job. Uh -huh. Now, unfortunately, I have a friend at uh, the University of Ottawa who is actually a scientist who studies procrastination. Uh -huh. And he says he has never been able to find evidence for that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I still believe it. Uh, so, so I'm not encouraging people to procrastinate. I'm saying if you are a procrastinator, be a structured procrastinator, you get a lot done. Uh, and, uh, you know, hmm. I, I, you, won't be, you won't be the worst person in the world. Okay. So I heard that your book, The Art of Procrastination, is a bestseller now. Is that true? Well, <laughs> it depends on what you mean by the word now. Uh, it actually made the New York Times bestseller list but not the top 10 that they published but the top 20. Right, so right. that's what I heard. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I was very happy with that. I, and I, you know, I, I never intended to write it but then um, an agent, so, so I had written an essay a long time before. Yeah, Structured Procrastination <laughs> and the website as well. And I won the Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> the Ig Nobel Prize is a prize, uh, I forget exactly how it's defined, but it's basically for writing something funny. Mm. And it's of some value. So I won the Ig Nobel Prize, which doesn't bring any money with it. <laughs> and he happened to read this, a guy, an agent in New York, and he wrote me and said, well, if I could get a, a short book out of this, he was sure he could get it published and it might sell well. Mm. Well, I have 10 grandchildren. <laughs> and uh, uh, I wanted to pay all their fees, tuition, and everything through college. 
which is not so trivial in America these days. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, here's a chance to earn some money that will help with that. So it compared to any book of mine, <laughs> it, <laughs> was, it is a bestseller. It's been translated into like 22 languages. And uh, the amazing thing is that it's still a bestseller in China. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of the Chinese procrastinating. I mean, I think we'd all be better off if they procrastinated a little more. <laughs> but, okay, but so the reason it really caught on there and still sells well. Okay. I just got a check for the Lithuanian rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> uh, so given your media exposure, do you consider yourself as a popularizer of philosophy, uh, philosophy social media influencer, so to speak? Well, I, I, yes and no. I, I think I've done my best as a teacher and then on the radio and working on this introduction book with uh, um, Michael Bratman and John Fisher uh -huh. and through the three dialogues I've written to uh, make philosophy accessible uh, to people that have some natural bent and interest in philosophy. Uh -huh. So I'd give myself a lot of credit for that. As to my own views, <laughs> uh, I haven't put a lot of effort into making them popular. I've put a lot of effort, effort into making them not be rejected out of hand. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, I don't know. I'm fairly well known, but I wouldn't say my views are popular. I mean, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, at the first level, I think they're right. At the higher level, I think, oh, well, I couldn't be right where Plato and David Lewis are wrong. Mm. But uh, that, I mean, the popularization has just kind of happened. <coughs> uh, I've never set out to be a popularizer. Uh, you ever read Will Durant's book, The Story of Philosophy? Yes, I did. That is a great book. Yep. I've never set out to write anything like that, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, who knows? Okay, so on a more personal note, you've been an academic philosopher for most of your life. You've seen all there is to see in this career, from being a lowly assistant professor to being a distinguished professor. So you've been really out there, so to speak. Make more to merit as professor. <laughs> but what's your advice to those who want to get into philosophy or those who want to get a career in doing philosophy? Well, the best advice is a bit impractical, is to somehow change things so you were born in 1943. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Because when I was getting my PhD, the children of baby boomers mm -hmm. Uh, uh, that is the baby boomers, <coughs> not the children of baby boomers, but the baby boomers, <coughs> the children of GIs freshly back from World War II. Uh -huh. For a lot of them, they were coming of age, they were going to college, and there weren't enough faculty to teach them. So for a while there, it wasn't that hard to get an academic job. Uh -huh. uh, and that's if you were a war baby, then you were just enough older to get in on that. And that's why I got a job at UCLA with one article published. <laughs> uh, uh, or maybe it wasn't even quite published, I don't know. And then got a job at Stanford with two articles published. <laughs> a tenured um, position at that. Yeah, now you, 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 there's no hope of doing that now. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, that's that's too bad. Now you have to have more publications than I had to get tenure to get a job. Mm -hmm. On on the other hand, uh, there's there's still some jobs out there, uh, and there's some backups. Uh, now it's uh, a philosophy major does better on the on the LSATs, the things you need to get into law school, uh -huh. than any other discipline. Um, as a matter of fact, philosophy majors do better on the MCATs Medicine. Than, most, than most pre meds. <laughs> that's interesting. No, it's probably not quite true, but it, it's based on something that's close to true. Uh 
Mm -hmm. I used to figure out all these things when I had to. So, so to be an undergraduate philosophy major is not to preclude you from doing anything for a living except philosophy. Mm -hmm. The same goes for getting an MA in philosophy. It means you'll be a little older by the time you get to law school or medical school or business school. Philosophers do very well on that, on the, whatever those are too. Um, and and so, so you do your best as a philosophy major, write a philosophy thesis and, and then, you know, see what happens. Uh -huh. uh, if, if you don't get into a PhD part, that's, that's a pretty good sign. Maybe just philosophy should be your hobby. <laughs> if you get into a good PhD program, uh, there's a good chance eventually you'll get a job. Uh -huh. However, you should realize that if you want to be a professional philosophy philosopher, you have to kind of be willing to live wherever you end up getting a job. Uh -huh. That's right. I mean, I, I would have been perfectly happy to go back to Lincoln, Nebraska. That's kind of all I ever thought I would do. But so I ended up in California where everybody wants to be, or at least until recently. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, But you, if, if you're going to go in for a four or six year stint of getting a PhD, you need to get girded for the fact that you may end up in Nebraska or Kansas or Calgary uh, rather than uh, Harvard or Manila or Palo Alto. <laughs> and, um, but that's not the end of the world if you can do philosophy. You yeah. have to feel that passionate about it. And if you feel that way, then I think it's still a very reasonable uh, place to aim for. Okay. Is the career worth it? Would you say that your career is worth it? Well, <clears throat> I've been pretty happy with my career and my, I've got uh, three children, 10 grandchildren, been married for 58 years or something. Mm. So I would say that's all worked out pretty well. Um, another problem with philosophy these days is, is uh, you know, if you're going to spend four years with a group of, or six years getting PhD with a group of other chances you'll fall in love with one of them, it's pretty good. <laughs> then you kind of have to find a place where you can both work. So it's, it's not easy. If you can fall in love with, uh, you know, somebody getting a PhD in something a little more marketable, mm -hmm. or maybe a lawyer or, you know, an entrepreneur who can move around where you move around, that's much better. So I often give people that advice. Mm -hmm. they never, don't, don't, don't fall in love with your, your, your guy you met in my seminar. I mean, for Christ's sakes, you'll end up... <laughs> You know, anyway, uh, but no, I, I think it's a wonderful, you meet a lot of interesting people, a decent percentage of which are very nice people. Mm -hmm. uh, you, um, you get to deal with the world's most interesting problems. Um, I think you get to do a lot of good in the sense of philosophy is a very good thing for undergraduates to learn. Uh -huh. So you're doing good teaching them philosophy and you're doing good teaching graduate students who will be able to go on and teach more undergraduate philosophy. It isn't exactly being an oncologist <laughs> people from cancer. There's uh -huh. no doubt about that. But I don't have the physical coordination to do surgery or the mental capacity to learn medicine. Um, and, you know, like, like right now, I, I mean, I think I could be a very good speechwriter for Joe Biden. <laughs> okay. Are you advertising? <laughs> well, no, but, I, you know, I have ideas and, uh, and sometimes they drive me crazy. Like, like the American Constitution, mm -hmm. like third sentence is it's the job of the federal government to provide for the general welfare. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. ever quotes that. Mm -hmm. You sit around and, and Republicans call you a socialist and you, then you don't know what to say. You don't need to say, I'm not a socialist or I, you just need to say, I read the constitution and I try to abide by it. <laughs> Whether you call it socialism or you call it 
uh, you know, there's nothing in the Constitution about libertarianism. There's nothing. Anne Rand was not a signer of the Constitution. <laughs> there's nothing in there about communism. There's nothing in there about socialism. But there is this very one important sentence. It's the job of the federal government mm -hmm. to ensure the general welfare. It's one of three jobs. The other is uh, military. And I forget what the third one is. Uh, <laughs> 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 rights, I guess. Yeah. So. Uh, so I could write great speeches, and I even wrote some speeches and sent them to various people, but they never paid any attention. So that's a little frustrating. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'm living with it. Okay. So on that note, thanks again for sharing your time with us, Professor Perry. And well, I enjoyed it tremendously, and I I'm so admire you for doing what you're doing. And you're doing it without some super dynamo like Ken Taylor <laughs> doing all the work. So congratulations and thanks. Thanks. Okay. For you guys, join me again for another episode of Philosophy of What and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. Okay. I, I hope our physical paths